you so much, Daniel. That was really great, and what a, what a fantastic way to kick off our discussion on build. I'm not, now going to invite um, our next panel on the topic of, of build, um, moderated by our friend Greg Lindsay from NYU and Fast Company. Please. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you, everyone, for coming back from lunch. Uh, welcome to the uh, to our uh, our plenary first plenary of the afternoon, the build session. Thank you, Daniel, for your um, inspiring uh, and <laughs> incredibly encyclopedic uh, tour of the world and your various projects. Um, our other panel members, I'd like to introduce each of them. Daniel Liebeskin quite literally needs no introduction at this point. Um, but sitting next to him is Jay Collins. He's the vice chairman of corporate of corporate investment at uh, at uh, corporate investment banking at Citibank. Um, he is responsible for driving content innovation innovation and replicable solutions across sovereign, supranational, and local governments. He's advised 46 governments on privatization and other matters. He's the one who's going to tell us how we can pay to build the human city. Um, seated next to him is Jan Werby, who's the Senior Vice President and Head of Sales and Marketing at Ericsson. Uh, before that, he was the Head of business, uh, business Unit Multimedia there and is going to talk about the technological infrastructure of the human city. Um, seated to his left is uh, Fadel Rashid. He's the Managing Director and CEO of Imar Economic City. Um, he and his, uh, his business are in, both in charge of the development and construction of King Abdullah Economic City. Uh, the first of four economic cities planned for the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and one of the world's most ambitious uh, cities being built from scratch. Um, and finally, at the end, um, is Otavio Zarvos, who, uh, who in his biography says he's just a businessman uh, who fell completely in love with cities um, and founded his company, Idea Zarvos Real Estate, in 2005 uh, with two goals in mind. One is to build housing uh, for everyone according to their, according to their need, uh, and the second is to create a positive architectural legacy for Sao Paulo, and I'm going to ask him about both. Um, so I guess the opening question I'd like to direct towards Daniel, who mentioned beforehand that he has recently spent a lot of time in Istanbul, uh, which as many of you may know is, is currently in the throes of, uh, of demonstrations, uh, very public in, in the public space of, of Taksim Gezi Park um, against the current regime of, of Erdogan. And, uh, and, and it started as a revolt against the, with the, the taking away of public space. It was, a, if you may have followed it, it was basically demonstrations that began when the government announced it would destroy a public park uh, to replace it with a mixed-use development of some form. Um, and so this is an interesting case. Uh, you know, in the case of the role of architects and the role of public space, um, cities like Istanbul, New York, all of these beautiful cities that we know and love are in the midst of skyscraper booms, these global financial capitals. How do we build and how do we accommodate that without destroying public space at the same time? It's a very interesting question because New York, uh, I don't know whether you noticed, but there was a plan given by the agencies in New York for Ground Zero which was public rejected, it's similar to what happened in Istanbul. But the public really rose in great uh, reverberations against the planning that was imposed on this site. And then the Lower Manhattan Development Corporation, the governor, the mayor, had to have a competition. And the competition was steered really by public interest. It was the public interest. There were you know, millions of people involved in interactive media, in, in, in exhibitions, in discussions. I think New York changed at that very moment because public participation became the primary element of driving the project. It was no longer business as usual. Port Authority will do the project. We'll give you something nice. Public was interested in public. Say, what are we getting? And I think that's true for all cities uh, in, in the world now. People want to know. Where is the public space? It's not just for others. It's no longer done from the ivory tower of kind of elite power. It is for people. And I think Istanbul was a very good example that people rose against the idea of planning, which was not consult consultative, which was not done in an open way. And I think only if you have transparency and, and tolerance and, and bring the views together, can you really create a consensus? And I think that's uh, what I fought for, a consensus. Otherwise, a site cannot really be rebuilt successfully. Even if you can build it, it mm -hmm. will never be successful. Mm -hmm. Well, just as a, as a backdrop to that, which I think is interesting, is that this, I mean, this, this tension is going to be played out over and over and over again, hundreds and thousands of times over the, over the next few decades. I mean, as many of you, I'm sure, are aware, I mean, you know, we're entering this phase where you know, uh, we're going to see sort of the final build out of humanity. We're going to see ur doubling of urban populations in the coming decades. Uh, we're going to see, you know, the sort of massive urban build out. I believe Sully Angel at NYU, one of my colleagues has predicted that, you know, we're going to see a doubling of human population over the next 40 years. And we're going to see a tripling in land cover. So we're going to see a massive explosion of everything on the ground. And the question is, is how do we build what the people want? How do we bring in, in human participation? I, I'd like to ask Otavio this, because I want to bring it back to Sao Paulo, since we are here, is, is, you know, how do you build, since your interest is in creating an architectural legacy for Sao Paulo, 
how do you ensure during that build out that you build what the people want? How do we involve the public in planning in that to build a greater Sao Paulo? And, and, and you know, how do you ensure that we just simply don't build in all directions? Bem, uh, a minha empresa é relativamente nova. Uh, a gente tem pouco, pouco menos de 10 anos. E no início eu realmente tinha uma visão urbanística uh, muito mais. Uh, muito mais rasa do que eu tenho hoje. Eu não sou nem arquiteto, nem urbanista, eu sou só um empresário. E eu me preocupei muito com, com o legado que a nossa empresa fosse deixar, ainda que pequeno, no primeiro momento, hoje já um pouco maior. Mas, a, a, depois desses quase dez anos, eu estou um pouco um pouco frustrado, assim, porque, na verdade, o legado que a gente tem deixado é para uma parte da cidade muito pequena. Né? A gente... E a cidade que a gente se discute, a cidade que eu participo e onde eu construo, ela ainda é a cidade de 5% da população de São Paulo. Então, eu acho que a verdadeira revolução em São Paulo não é... é não, não, eu, não é ainda, eu acho que, a revolução estética. Eu acho que a verdadeira revolução aqui seria a gente construir a cidade para todos e trazer de volta a 95% da população pobre em São Paulo. A gente tem uma diferença social muito grande muito maior do que essas cidades onde o Daniel fez grandes obras. A gente está num, num, numa cidade que é muito mais perto de Mumbai do que de Buenos Aires. Então, eu, eu acho que o grande desafio aqui seria trazer de volta essa população que foi expulsa da, da região mais rica, com os melhores empregos, nas últimas décadas. Né? Infelizmente, eu não vejo nada sendo feito nesse sentido. Eu acho que os esforços de grandes planejamentos urbanos, é, de agora com o novo plano diretor, eles ainda levam é, em mente que é, a gente deve manter essa cidade rica e, e aprazível que nós temos para essa classe média alta, que, que, que detém esse status que ela sempre teve, e a gente está procurando deixar essa população que é a verdadeira dona da cidade fora desse ambiente aqui. É, então, a gente tem dois São Paulo, a gente tem um pequeno São Paulo onde pouca gente usufrui, e uma grande cidade que não participa da discussão, que não usufrui de nada, e que, nem te, infelizmente, não tem nem condições de participar. Né? É, e, então, eu acho que a gente ainda está num momento pré-histórico, vamos dizer, de urbanismo. E como a gente está falando sobre uma, uma cidade humana, eu acho que eu ainda comparo o São Paulo com um jovem que veio do campo, que tem péssimos hábitos ainda, que não sabe viver numa cidade, acho que essa é a verdade, a gente tem, a gente não não sabe viver numa grande metrópole, é, principalmente a classe média alta, que é quem quem manda nessa cidade, quem determina o zoneamento, o urbanismo. Eu acho que hoje eu tenho muito mais consciência de que é, a, a minha empregada, por exemplo, que que faz um, uma grande viagem entre a, a minha casa e a casa dela, todos os dias, ela está muito mais educada para viver numa metrópole do que eu. E eu acho que a gente deveria aprender um pouco com essas pessoas que estão sobrevivendo em São Paulo, não vivendo, né? porque elas, eu acho que é uma, elas estão num momento de sobrevivência, e tentar agora dar de volta tudo o que elas deram para a gente, o que a gente tirou delas. né? Então, eu acho que a cidade, a gente antes da parte estética, do, da qual eu, eu, eu sou um... um um profundo defensor e é parte central do meu negócio, eu acho que a gente deve pensar um pouco em trazer essas pessoas de volta para a cidade. That was excellent, and I have many questions when I continue in that vein, but first I want to get, before we delve into issues, I think, of public housing and because of these issues of inequality, which I think are critical to this, I do want to add one, one wrinkle to this, which is you know, that in addition to the physical building boom that is currently underway around the globe, you know, what stands as critical at this moment in, in the history of urbanization is that now we're creating this sort of dimension of digital space over it. We're overlaying a whole new level of information interaction um, and arguably a sort of digital public space that's happening invisibly all around us. And, and Jan, I guess I wanted to ask you about this, which is you know, how should we be thinking about this digital overlay at this point in time? You know, 
five, 10 years ago, you know, people were talking about municipal Wi-Fi grids, which I think now we could even argue that's a human right at this point. Um, what is going to be the sort of the future of that overlay and what is the critical infrastructure that has to go in there? Is it more than just Wi-Fi? What should, and should cities control and own their own data? How do they make that accessible? What, what are sort of the public spaces of the, the internet, of the, public, of the public space in the digital realm? Shall I um, show a couple of slides? Yes, by all Thank means. you. So good afternoon, everyone. As a founding member of, of the New Cities Foundation, I'm really happy to see you all here. Um, to start from, from the vision uh, where we soci see societies going in Ericsson, we have a vision of the network society. What is that? That's a society where everything that benefits from being connected is connected. And we feel we're actually on the brink to that society right now. Um, and, and of course, this change will be pretty dramatic when it happens. It will change the fundamentals of how we live and how we work. It's almost like the Industrial Revolution 100, 150 years ago and the impact that had on, on society. Um, when I say we're on the brink, let's look at some numbers. Today, we have passed 6.4 billion mobile subscribers in the world. That means that sometime during this year, we will have as many mobile subscribers as we have people on this earth. Uh, we're looking at 9 billion subscribers 2018 or in our latest projection. Uh, of course, then we run out of people. But many people, as you know, probably m most in this room, have more than one mobile device, probably a smartphone, a pad, or a laptop connected or something like that. We also see data traffic continuously increasing. Only four years ago in the mobile networks, it was as much voice as data. Today, it's 10 times as much data. Data traffic have doubled over the past 12 months, and we see it doubling every year going forward. So that's a dramatic increase. And what really drives this is, of course, smartphones. Today, 20% of all subscriptions in the world are smartphones. And as we see from our studies, the old phone you used pretty much 90%, perhaps a few SMSs, but the rest was talk. Now with your smartphone, 75% of the time, you're actually surfing the web, access internet in some form or fashion, whether it's for work or entertainment. So that's a totally change uh, in, in behavior. Um, and the other important piece is, of course, the availability of mobility. Uh, today, um, the overall mobile coverage is 90% of the world's population. And actually, you can access high-speed data on the mobile in 55% of the population. So that's all, all quite dramatic numbers. Where is Dan Ericsson in this? Where we are the leader in mobile infrastructure, double the size of our closest competitor, uh, and focusing on cities. Uh, we have, I think, a bit over 40% market share in the top 100 cities. 45% of all smartphone tra traffic is carried in our networks. And we are a leader in the early, tough, demanding data networks around the world. So, of course, we built our heritage in voice, but over the past five, six years, it's all data. And that's really a challenge coming back to the infrastructure in the cities because data drives capacity. It drives the number of sites. Sao Paulo is a good example. 7,000 sites to support the mobile infrastructure here, support for all of you to be able to call and use your smartphones. Uh, it's also a good example how we are present in 3G. I think we're supplying three of the four operators and in 4G, it's actually all four. So you will have good 4G here in the city, independent of operator. So who's driving this change? Is it uh, the businesses? No, it's not. Is it the uh, city governments? No, it's not. It's all of us as citizens, the city dwellers. We love to be able to use the entertainment in smartphones. We, we uh, also, of course, love that we can be more efficient at work just be, while, while having and using this, uh, this technology. Um, we have uh, 
done some studies in our consumer lab of actually city people. And a good mobile service is as, po as important on the rating of people as having uh, clean water. That says something about how much of utility it is. Um, and of course, in this forum, we talk a lot about infrastructure, roads, buildings, things that you can see. Obviously, this infrastructure you typically don't see at all, but it's so important. I mean, the other important factor is that people are still fairly happy of their mobile coverage at home, but also at work, but very dissatisfied in between the two spots. So traveling, whether it's in traffic or underground, there's a lot to do. Um, so my request to all of you in this room is, of course, to strongly support the continued build out. You saw all the, uh, the numbers here with the data traffic going up, the number of smartphones going up. We see 50% will have smartphones only in a few years, uh, probably using per smartphone four times as much data as today. Um, so there will be a big need of sites. There will also be a big need of frequencies because that's what's used for these, these systems. Um, is it a technology issue? No, it's not. There's operators here as well ready to invest because with data users, they get so picky. So customer satisfaction for the operators is number one. They are willing to invest. And we see this in, in the lead markets in, in, in high-speed data. So it's really up to administrative hassles for new sites, which often called permits, or it's regulation around frequencies. That's so important. So I think the cities in the world that don't address this will actually lose out in uh, competitiveness. So, so um, we are looking very much forward to a fantastic world in the network society. Thank you. Thank you. Did that answer your question? It did, it did. <laughs> and inspired many more. Well, one of the other interesting trends, thank you for that, uh, and that invokes all sorts of other sort of interesting uh, uh, tangents to pursue. But one of, the, one of the interesting trends that I, I've seen over the last few years, which I think is interesting, is that the city itself has come to be seen as a form of technology. You can build a city from scratch as a means to an end, whether it is uh, for trade wars or whether it is to create jobs or whether it is uh, the sustainable eco-city trend, you know, the notion of the city as a template for how to uh, create a more sustainable world. Um, and all of these are fascinating examples. And I wanted to ask uh, Fawn about one of these, because Cake is an, is, is an example of one of these. It is a city that was sort of commissioned by the kingdom uh, as a place to create work, as a place to create a sort of new society for its citizens. Um, and it is a private city, which I think is sort of interesting, a, 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 a genus of city that's really only existed in the last few decades. So I was hoping you could talk, I guess, a bit about what Cake sort of heralds in terms of a sort of public-private city and, and how we're going to see the sort of rise of these privatized cities working with governments to create these hundreds of habitats that we're going to have to do for the urban boom. So, Well, thanks, Greg, for that. I think, you know, when you look at, when we talked earlier today about the 180,000 people that move into cities every day and you think and you project that into the future, and you think, what would it cost? What does it cost to host all of these people in cities by 2030? And, and the numbers are mind-boggling. You're talking about almost $60 trillion in investment in infrastructure to be able to host people in these cities. That's a scary number. And with all of the fiscal troubles that governments are having all around the world, it's really interesting to question whether uh, governments have the capability, funding-wise and, and execution-wise, to be able to accommodate this urban um, century, if you will. So our engagement as a, as a private sector in the development of King Abdullah Economic City is a very interesting model, I think. It, is, it has to be proven over the next few years, but I'll, I'll talk a little bit about it and where we are. Um, um, King Abdullah Economic City basically is a, is a new city created north of Jeddah, about 100 kilometers north of Jeddah on the Red Sea. And um, it will be able to host 2 million people. Physically, it's the size of Washington, D.C. Completely private. It's the first special economic zone in the country. So the role of the government is to provide the regulatory framework and the facilitation for it. But the uh, role of the private sector is to master plan, execute, finance um, uh, this development. So you think about this, and now seven years later after launch, we are uh, already opening the first privatized port uh, in the country, and it's going to be one of the largest 10 ports in the world. 
We are doubling the capacity of the kingdom in terms of its ability to handle logistics. We have attracted 50 companies, created 10,000 jobs, and attracted about $10 billion of investment. So something is working. The question is, can the private sector really deliver a human city? And that's, I think, the, 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 you know, the queasy part about the private sector, because we are not used to uh, this kind of model. And that brings you to think about current governance models. In most cities, you know, you have an elected mayor, right? That elected mayor is elected every four to six years. So that's their feedback loop. Every four to six years, they know they did a good job or not. They, only, they also only need 51% of the vote, right? So if there's 49% of the population that really can vote somebody else, it doesn't really matter. So if you think about that governance model, it's actually quite scary. And if you think about many countries in the world where that, even that is, where the mayor is appointed, that's even scarier, right? So in our case, you know, the model has its downsides, uh, but you know, we're publicly listed, so people have a choice to pick whether we're doing a good job or not by actually voting with their, uh, their money, mm -hmm. literally. And uh, so every three months, I know whether we did a good job in the past quarter or not by delivering the right product, uh, et cetera. Now, the question is, well, okay, well, what if people can't vote with their money? What if they don't have sufficient money? to do that, but because we own the master plan, we think about what industries we're trying to create. We know that 40% of our residents are going to be affordable and low income. And I think the problems of slums all around the world is that somebody that did the planning for these cities didn't really think about what kind of jobs they're going to be created in these cities and actually plan for these housing. And I can tell you that our, our plan over the next five years of all of the housing that we will build, 40% is going for affordable and labor housing. I can also tell you that we gave away voluntarily. We had approvals from the government to build by the sea, but we gave away 15 kilometers of seafront to create a public park. Again, because we think about the master plan as our really value creator, and we think about these uh, sustainability is uh, issues as well. So it's a very interesting model. I think it will prove to be a very successful one, and uh, we're, we're driving it forward. My worry, though, mm -hmm. about this, uh, you know, this discussion about the future of urbanization and the urban century is, and I think very few people are talking about it today, is if you really have another two and a half billion people moving into cities over the next 20 years, well, real estate values will increase. As an economist, uh, you, you, you think about that. And are these people are really going to be able to afford to live in these cities? And are we creating new forms of slums? in these cities? Are we really planning for that kind of migration in the appropriate way? Uh, I don't have the answer, but, uh, but I, you know, I, I have not heard many people talk about that yet. No. Great. Thank you, Fahad. Um, rounding out sort of this introductory remarks phase, I wanted to ask Jay, uh, you know, how are we going to pay for all this? This is like the question that looms behind all this. I mean, I remember reading a report that came out a few years ago that predicted the world's greatest infrastructure boom, that in the fall of 2008, that we were going to see all of this stimulus, trillions of dollars, gush into the financial capital system because all these governments would unloose stimulus on the world. And instead, we got the age of austerity. So my question is, is how are we? I mean, now that we seem to be coming out of this sort of austere phase, um, but how are we going to pay for all this? How are the capital markets going to react to this crying need for this? And does that mean we're going to see, you know, sort of new models in which large chunks of existing cities are essentially privatized in this? I mean, we've seen Macquarie and others go into this area. But, um, but you know, what are the sort of financial models that we're going to see evolving over the next decade or two decades um, as, you know, essentially as the banks realize that there is a tremendous opportunity in urbanization as well, as well as downside? Okay, let, let, me, let me take that on in pieces. First, just to frame the magnitude of the challenge. We're talking about going from, um, call it 2.6 trillion people to uh, a world where by 2050 we'll have 6.3 trillion. Um, Trillion, billion people, I'm sorry, excuse me, billion people living in urban cities. So half the world's population um, today, but by 2050, 6.3 billion people out of 9 billion um, in urban centers. The magnitude of that movement and the required investment for it um, is 
as you said earlier, is other, it's staggering. Um, right now, around the world, there's a total of about $3 trillion of infrastructure spend every year. Um, and yet, that's not meeting the capacity needs. That's not even keeping up with a 4% of GDP necessary investment just to maintain infrastructure. Um, and of course, as the population migrates to the cities, and particularly with the mega cities, the infrastructure needs, um, be it energy, power, be it roads, bridges, tunnels, shipping and ports, um, uh, airports, that spend will be concentrated in urban centers. Um, now, right now, out of the, call it $3 trillion a year in, uh, in infrastructure spending globally, only 300 to 400 billion of that is done with the private sector. Governments are essentially doing, carrying 90% of that weight, and they can't do it anymore. The fiscal pressures on them, the debt burdens, debt deficit, hurdles and the market's willingness to continue to finance governments in this environment is limited. So we can't survive in a world where so much, so little is done by the private sector. Um, now, to complicate matters further, second part of this story, um, you mentioned correctly the need for the banks and the capital markets to play a role. Um, we're in a brand new regulatory environment in the world under what's called Basel III. So Basel III is requiring um, putting new, new capital requirements on bank that is fundamentally unfriendly to infrastructure, right? It's limiting the bank's ability to finance infrastructure. So to give you some specific examples, infrastructure typically in the credit sweet spot of infrastructure, which would be single B, double B space, um, the threshold for banks um, will cost maybe 100 to 200 basis points more to finance projects under a new regulatory environment. Mm -hmm. With the liquidity ratios placed on banks, banks that were willing to finance 15 to 20 year infrastructure projects won't be able to do that anymore. They'll do five to seven year projects, but they won't be able to continue to finance long term. Um, and certainly with the crisis of European banks, um, and, and the situation in Europe, European banks won't be able to continue to play the, the role they have. Um, just to give you an idea, banks have financed 90% of the private sector infrastructure in the past, 90%. Capital markets have done 10%. And of that 90%, 70% was done by European banks. Well, you all read in the paper what's going on with the European crisis and the European bank environment right now, that's not European banks financing infrastructure in Europe. That was Europe, European banks coming to Latin America, coming really around the world to the emerging markets and facilitating um, infrastructure spend. So with the magnitude of the investments needed, with the crisis and the new regulatory framework in the banking market, we're going to need to see a couple of things done. And happy to add more if there's time, but I'll just I'll make three points. I think one is the obvious one is there has to be more public-private partnerships in cities around the world for governments to come together, not just the urban city government, but there's going to be requirements at the central government level to form more public-private partnerships. Um, second, uh, we'll need to be able to access capital markets. The banks will not be able to do this um, in the future. And so we're going to have to come up with creative structures that allow a 20-year project that can only be financed by the bank market for the first five to seven years to be refinanced, if not fully financed, in the capital markets. And there are a lot of people spending an awful lot of time right now trying to figure out how to do that. Um, and third, and, and very importantly, is the role of development banks. Um, international financial institutions that can play a role in, in taking on targeted risk. Um, here in Brazil, you're familiar with Bandes and, and, and the role in, in, uh, in development of infrastructure in Brazil. But whether it's the IFC, whether it's EIB, the development banks of the world will have to come in and take parts of the risk. 
Components of the risk include, for example, this refinancing risk, um, coming up with structures that allow a bridging between the bank markets and the capital markets. Um, IFC has, has some great ideas on that. We've seen EIB, for example, the European Investment Bank, look at um, how to credit enhance what, what monoline insurers did before the, before the crisis, credit enhance so that institutional investors, pension funds and insurance companies around the world could actually buy infrastructure. Those investors tend not to want to buy, buy weak credit, um, non-investment grade infrastructure projects. So there are structures now and opportunities for these development banks to credit enhance, remove some of the risk, improve it so that we can actually place more of this tr tremendous um, financing need, place that paper into the capital markets. Great. Thank you for that. All right, Daniel, I have to ask now. We've just heard about the technological overlay of cities. We've just heard about the political implications of massive informal settlements. We've just heard about building entire cities from scratch, and we've just heard about the massive capital, request, uh, capital investments required. Where does the architect fit into this giant building boom? Because every architect I know constantly bemoans how they are completely marginalized by the technological, political, and economic forces that try to relegate them to basically being, you know, a, 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 a statisticians, as Otavio put it. So, you know, how, how does an architect work into this, and how do architects claim more power for themselves, I guess, in the role of creating the human city, because they have been steadily marginalized for at least the last five decades. It's a great question, because we all flock to cities that are beautiful, that are nice. We want to be in those cities. Those cities have a character, spatial character. They're not just uh, abstractions. They, they, they offer streets. They offer views. They offer a sense of dignity. They offer a sense of social justice. They offer a sense of the future. They offer a kind of a dream come true idea. So let's, let's look at it. We have China has hundreds and hundreds of cities. They're called, you know, small cities, three million people, uh, where government is giving incentives, but nobody wants to stay. They all want to go to Shanghai, to Beijing, to Guangzhou, to cities that have sort of history, that have an enhancement of the cultural life and a possibility for a person to develop themselves. So I always think that history is not a footnote here. History is not something you can buy in a store. You can't just invent it. You have to take a place, whether it's a piece of desert, whether it's an old city, whether it's a rising city, whether it's a new dream. One has to work with a sense that there is a connection, that a city tells a story. The story is not always completely visible. It's partly invisible, hidden, often repressed, often unacknowledged. But I think the successful cities are cities that have been able to navigate through this labyrinth and be able to sort of face a future that is full of kind of dynamism and also beauty, because we often, you know, that's not something you find on any, uh, you know, spreadsheet. You know, wh whether it's, you know, what does, it, what does the city look like? So I think architecture is a great role to play. I think uh, it, the idea of kind of the star architect, the star project that brings, you know, tourism and so on, it's, it's just a very limited idea because we don't really ultimately judge the cities by their museums or by their public buildings. We judge the cities by how well do people live in those cities? How beautiful are the streets? How nice is it to look out of a window? And I actually happen to think that in the future, being in a city will be also part of, part of public health. You know, if you have a horrible window looking at a blank wall, your, your physical and mental health decline. So it is a matter of public health. It's a matter of public culture. And I think that is the tradition of great cities because you know, destinies of cities are created by poetry. I mean, that's a strange thing to say in a conference which has so many experts and so many numbers, but I really think that Emily Dickinson, uh, my favorite poetess, 19th century American poet, she said, when I, rec I reckon when I, count it to when I count it all, first poets, then the sun, then summer, then the heaven of God, then the list is done. So she says basically, no, oh, Brazil, I mean, Sao Paulo has the heaven of God, it has the summer, it has the sun, the poetry of a city. Now, poetry simply means to make something. It doesn't, it's not some high highfalutin. Everybody's a poet. We have to give people the tools, and, uh, the, the, because everybody's an artist, really. The idea that people are just you know, second-rate citizens just voting yes or no is wrong. People have creative impulses. Everyone is born with an incredible creative artistic mind to empower people, and I, that is how 
you know, there are different ways to empower. I, I believe that, and I'm working on several projects which really work with non-architects to design buildings and to streets, and so not with architects, but with people. They can give them a pencil, give them a computer, give them a sense of form, give them a piece of cardboard, a piece of wood, and they will tell you that, yeah, the world can become a more beautiful place. Well, thank you. I'd like to give almost right of rebuttal almost to, to thought on this because if, if there's going to be a city on the panel that we can say that has no history, by definition, it will be cake. And so, you know, I guess the flip side of that question becomes then, how do we build a city at scale? How do we build a, a city from scratch? This is a challenge that so many architects have tried and failed utterly. Um, you know, I, I think I was, uh, I think it was about five minutes into the, uh, the noon plenary where, I, where someone brought up Brasilia, of course, it is the ghost that hangs over all of these heads here in Niemeyer's own building. I think we have to consider that. Um, where even he and, and Costa, of course, both failed at creating a city from scratch, at least in the pilot plan form. So how, how do we do this? I mean, how do we, how do we sit there and, and scope out an entire city and encapsulate all those hopes and dreams? Because those of us, you know, who live in the Jane Jacobs tradition would tell you, that a great city is formed over emergence, you know, over many small rules and many, many small fates. So how can we get it right this time? Because we have to. A very good question. In fact, I think it's the, you know, man's gut disease, if you will, you know, where we think we can actually form these cities in a way that, uh, you know, th th these cities, uh, you know, it's an art more than a science. You just can't, I cannot sit here and say, you know, I have control, I can do it, I'm going to, make it the most beautiful, most culturally, most inclusive city in the world. We have to remember that governments and private sector, we, we don't build cities. It is people and companies and, you know, we invest our lives in our cities, you know. So I think the city has to offer an environment where people can express themselves. And that's where you'll actually get people really fully invested in a city. A city that does not respect its citizens is a city that has lost already. So I think that's the, the, the change in mind shift. Uh, I was still, you know, want to contain the architects as much as possible because, you know, we're a private sector and we think about it. But ultimately, you need to give people an, an ability to really express themselves by allowing the city to respect them. Well, this is a follow-up to that. I mean, who, who are CAKE's architects in this case? How was that designed? Because so many mega projects are being designed by very small teams. I mean, I think I heard a story, it might be apocryphal, that the, you know, the Delhi-Mumbai Industrial Corridor, dozens of cities and millions of people, uh, has a full-time staff of 20 people. You know, it's, it's, a, it's amazing the, the scale of these projects. I mean, yeah. how big is the scale of CAKE and the team that built it? You know, we, we were showing the master plan. This is actually the third master plan that we have in seven years. And what I'm trying to say is that these master plans need to be very flexible. The problem with, with government, when government is leading the development of a city, is that government gets stuck. There's committee after committee after committee, and no matter what the market is telling you about that you're doing something wrong, it doesn't change. I mean, look at all of these cities that have declined. They just simply couldn't change course, although they can see the city dying. So the master plan needs to be a very flexible document that changes as people are telling you, you know, you're doing a really bad job. And, 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 and you, you know, how does a city, irrespective of its governance, allow citizens and companies to basically create that feedback loop, whether it's through voting or through, you know, now we have a lot of social media, it's much easier to empower the citizen. Um, but then, each building, you know, needs to take on its, a life of its own without imposing on, on the environment in a negative manner. So, you know, we think about this, this city in a master plan, uh, you know, at the master plan level, but then each, each and every component of the city, every building has to add value to that master plan, and it's not, and not take away value from it. Yeah. Can, can I just Please. comment? I, I don't think there is any place in the world which is a tabula rasa. I mean, even if you're building it, it there is history. History has taken place. Uh, the world is full of movements that we don't really acknowledge, and so no place in a way, it's just an empty piece of paper, nothing, just create sort of an abstract uh, you know, diagram. I think every good master plan, and I agree with you, has to be dynamic enough to be able to absorb and continue evolving. And I think the great cities have been able to cope with evolution. Uh, in other words, uh, it, it was said b uh, before that there is an incompleteness in cities, but I think there's an incompleteness in human beings. You know, we are not completed. So the idea of, of, of freedom, 
uh, uh, creative freedom, I think, it, it is built into the master plan. I think that's, I think, an essential way to acknowledge that there is history, that we're not working with just a machine. And I think all those dreams of, uh, of ideology in the 20th century, you know, we're gonna, uh, the city's a perfect machine to live in, or a house is a perfect machine. It is a machine, but it's not enough, you know, because, you know, it's, it's hard to, to be, a, 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 just a participant in a machine. There has to be something that is emotive, that is human, and that is vulnerable to make a city great. And I think all great cities face dangers. All great cities are risks because you know they started as nothing. And my, my window at Ground Zero looks at you know Wall Street, and I see all the and and I have a guidebook to New York written in 1900 and says Trinity Church. Go to Trinity Church, the highest point of New York. So all that stuff is after 1900, basically. So it is possible to create these great cities. Well, I want to, but I want to go back to Otavio from there then, because we you know we're talking about great cities now, and I think what is unspoken or what we're dancing around here is that these great superstar cities, the Shanghai's that are millions from the countryside, you know, are, are you know, are one overshadowing these smaller struggling cities, and two, they're massively unequal and only growing more so. I mean, even in New York, I'm from New York, of course, and and you know, Mayor Bloomberg will end his term after 12 years and has built you know, the wealthiest city that's ever existed, and half of the population of New York is living in poverty. So we've completely bifurcated the city in two. And this is you know, a, a, not nearly as, as, a, as in, unequal as many of the cities across the global south. And so I want to come back to Otavio here, because you know, there are exceptions. There are the New Yorks of the world, and there are, you know, ki there are governments like uh, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, which has the will and the resources to build entire cities from scratch as a sort of mitigation against allowing slums and informal settlements to happen. Um, but how does a city like Sao Paulo address this? What is, you know, do you, I'm, I'm asking you to solve the, 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 uh, the slum challenge right now for us. Um, but, you know, what are the, th the sort of ways of thinking about slums that can help address these kinds of questions? Because I think we go back and forth between demonizing informal settlements and then celebrating them as these pathways to the middle class and success and that they're really great machines. But I, I'm curious, you know, what do you think is a way forward with that? Bem, realmente... Alô. É, realmente, eu acho que, é, apesar de São Paulo estar numa situação caótica, a gente tem uma grande vantagem por ser uma cidade relativamente jovem e a gente poder aprender com cidades é, mais maduras que deram certo e que não deram certo. Acho que as cidades também, elas eu não acredito que elas tenham, que a gente possa dizer que ela está, todo dia, eu acho que ela está nascendo e morrendo. E é difícil, às vezes as pessoas têm uma percepção, mesmo aqui em São Paulo, de que a cidade já foi melhor ou já foi pior. Né? Acho que isso, isso é uma coisa muito subjetiva, porque é, às vezes ela pode ter piorado para determinadas, para uma determinada classe social ou um grupo de pessoas e ter melhorado muito para outras. É, eu acho que aqui em São Paulo, é, como eu disse, antes da questão estética, a gente está numa num momento tão primário que eu prestaria muito mais atenção ao uso do que já foi construído até agora, porque a cidade também, de uma certa forma, ela está subutilizada. Eu acho que a gente tem espaços subutilizados, a gente tem imóveis com usos errados, nos lugares, às vezes, é, errados também. É, eu acho que antes de... Aqui em São Paulo, a gente a, até pela falta de recursos que nós temos, e, obviamente, os recursos financeiros são um desses recursos, a, a gente deveria prestar mais atenção em, talvez, primeiro, reorganizar o, os recursos que nós temos. E, e daí que eu, eu acredito muito no arquiteto, porque, na minha opinião, o arquiteto, fundamentalmente, ele é um organizador de recursos. Eu, eu acho que isso é, é fundamentalmente como o, o arquiteto deveria ser visto. Ele é uma pessoa que tem que você tem que estabelecer para ele um custo, um determinado tipo de material, de mão de obra, e, e aquilo que você deseja, e ele tentar organizar isso aqui. Eu acho que aqui em São Paulo, é, nós precisamos confiar um pouco mais nos arquitetos, eu, eu diria. É, infelizmente, a gente está numa, numa, onde a, a, praticamente a maioria da nossa população ela não sabe viver numa grande metrópole, nós somos muito novos, e isso para nós é uma novidade, é, então, eu acho que o arquiteto ele tem uma função aqui em São Paulo de quase um pai para a população, que é, é ensiná-los e, e também dizer não. Né? Eu acho que é, é muito importante aqui a gente dizer o que não o que não pode ser feito. Né? Porque 
A gente achei interessante a colocação de uma cidade privada, onde você não tem esse problema da discussão do plano diretor de, de quatro em quatro anos ou de dez em dez anos. É, numa cidade privada, você não tem um, um grande problema, que é a questão populista. Né? Então, você consegue pensar um pouco mais a longo prazo. Aqui em São Paulo, acredito que no Brasil inteiro, a gente tem esse problema, que é, é o político, que deveria ser um... um uma pessoa para equilibrar as forças, e essas forças são entre a população e a iniciativa privada. Né? Ele ele tem, ele tem fica numa sempre numa situação dúbia, que é querer contentar a população e sempre oferecer o caminho mais fácil, e, e muitas vezes colocar o, o empreendedor como um inimigo. Né? Às vezes, colocar o empreendedor como inimigo é a maneira mais fácil de você reunir uma série de pessoas que vão votar em você. É, então, eu, eu acho que a gente deveria aqui fazer uma reflexão e, e tentar unir um pouco mais essa tríplice aliança assim que haveria que, que, que deve haver numa sociedade para se organizar, que seria o, 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 o empreendedor, a iniciativa privada, a população e o governo. É, e eu diria que, acima dessas três pessoas, tem que ter um especialista, que é o arquiteto. Né? Ele, ele, obviamente, essa escolha do arquiteto ela é muito delicada, porque é, ele ele também tem que ser um, uma pessoa que tenha sabedoria para saber não apenas o que a gente quer, mas o que a gente pode ter com os recursos que nós temos. Né? Não adianta a gente imaginar que São Paulo vai virar uma Paris ou vai virar uma Nova York. E isso que eu, eu, eu acho que seria um, um início para uma discussão para uma cidade melhor aqui. Great. Can I, can I, can I, yes, Jay. 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 Yes, Jay. 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 You know, cities in, I think now, you know, 103 countries in the world. So we see cities all over and we see good governments and bad governments. As you said, sometimes <coughs> governments just don't move fast enough. But actually in the urban space, I think there's spectacular change in governments comparing notes, sharing experiences, and particularly searching for best practices. And I think, you know, the kinds of ideas that we're talking about today you see the best out there wanting to look at other cities in the world and learn from them in a way that we just hadn't seen before. Um, where we see you know, um, cities sending their senior security officials to other cities to learn, um, where you will have a, a, a bicycle plan like we rolled out in New York compared globally with the best bicycle programs out there to make sure that you get it right where you have uh, a Hong Kong, a, a, a Singapore, um, being visited by mayors from all over the world to learn what the best modernization and investment programs are to keep up with, with the influx of, of people. So I think this is a new world where, where innovation will come from, from comparing notes across cities in the world and, um, and really this search for uh, some commonality of best practice. Well, I was, I was gonna ask you actually if, if there is, I mean, you talked about some of the really big picture, I think, uh, you know, sort of changes in the global capital markets. And there's always this sort of notion, I know an urbanist that think of cities at the whims of global capital and hot flows. I was curious if you've seen some interesting examples within cities of municipal responses to this. I, I'm thinking, for example, Chicago comes to mind for me, um, partly because I'm from there and partly because, you know, they've done really interesting experiments at both ends of the scale, you know. Uh, they were one of the first to privatize infrastructure. Mayor Rahm Emanuel has created this infrastructure trust, trying to lure in institutional investors. And then at the other end, they're creating a land bank where they're, where they're essentially acquiring foreclosed properties to essentially renovate them and then put them back on the market. Uh, and also a land trust where they're going to take land off the market permanently and as, as a way of sort of new low cost housing. I was curious if you've seen any other sort of interesting examples that are city led in terms of right. grappling with the financial well, markets. I, I would say, and, and I, this is not with being American, but, but certainly looking at municipal finance in the United States, I think that what cities have done in terms of the creativity there of 
of developing a very sophisticated um, capital market driven financing mechanism for urban America um, is tremendous. Now, we haven't done well on privatizations, but if you look at, um, you know, from the, the Los Angeles to the Miami, the, the, the Dallas to the Chicago's, it's the creativity and the access to the capital markets that, quite frankly, when we go back to what I said earlier about this massive um, infrastructure financing challenges, many, many municipalities, many cities um, are limited by law, by regulatory framework, by the central government in terms of how they can access financing. Um, part of that is from the history of bad behavior, um, where cities actually, or states, regional governments, um, finance themselves to the point where the central government had to step in and bail them out. Um, but nonetheless, those restrictions in the modern day with these needs will have to be, we'll have to get more creative. And we're seeing that now with the Olympics, with uh, uh, World Cup, with some of the states here trying to structure their financing needs in different ways here in Brazil, but still subject to tremendous limitations. And I think the, the experience of, uh, of the US of being able to access bond markets, tax exempt, with so tax incentivized, mm -hmm fundraising that doesn't rely on the banks um, is a lesson learned to many. Again, done prudently so that we don't find that we've over indebted our cities to the point that we, as we have with, with central governments uh, in the world. Great. Jan, I have one last technology question for you before we open it up to audience Q&A. And that is the question, you know, I, I found it interesting in terms of privatizing infrastructure. When I mentioned that, it made me think of Provo selling Google its entire broadband for a dollar. And so we're seeing other cities in the United States begging Google to come there to build their grids because they feel they can't possibly keep up. And we've also seen examples where, you know, municipal Wi-Fi was derailed because essentially there was no guarantee they'd be able to optimize it over the 10-year span of the contract. My, my question for you is, it's a long way of asking, is how do we future-proof cities when it comes to that technological overlay? Because I've noticed as a general trend in talking to technology companies about urbanism is they tend to see cities almost at the upgrade cycle and planned obsolescence cycle of technology products. I've literally talked to startups that once believed that, or tried to convince me that we would junk buildings like we junk servers. You know, once it became an obsolete, we would just throw that out. Um, obviously, that's not going to happen. So how do we do that? How do we make sure that we are not building obsolete technological infrastructure into our cities that will require rip and replace at great cost and distress? Now, I think, first of all, I mean, if you just look at the heritage of, of the telecoms world, <clears throat> it's, it's uh, 130 or so years. Um, I mean, it's always a technology evolution. So even if you take the steps for the consumer, that's great. There's always a big lag. I mean, um, the technology that was introduced in the 80s are still up running. But then, as it makes sense for the consumer, they get new devices, very much driven by the handset market. Um, then you evolve forward um, and the operators are quite keen of course to kind of maximize the utilization of their investment uh, but of course we as a technology partner also always secure that you can can trend forward so coming back to your question about Wi-Fi it's a typical example now where we actually integrate Wi-Fi in the mobile networks so it becomes that's been a bit of the lack of success of those standalone Wi-Fi networks because you're there, but you're not connected at other places. I mean, while the success of mobile telephony is that you have pretty much one standard across the globe, and wherever you go, it works. It's pretty fantastic. Great. All right, well, before I open up to audience Q&A, I'm told we have a bit of a surprise, if that surprise is going to happen, but all right, I guess it will happen momentarily. Are there any questions from the audience? I see a few. Do we have microphones nearby or anything? Um, I guess over here first, there's a hand in the air. Please identify yourself. <coughs> sure. My name is Ralph Earl from a German uh, engineering company for high tech infrastructure and facilities. Um, I, I basically two questions. When I listen to the discussion, it always appears about the, the mega cities of the futures is about private space, obviously, living space, and then office space. 
and how to best combine those two topics. I w I'm wondering, is the industrial part, the manufacturing part, really such a neglectable uh, issue for the cities of the future? Or is it, shouldn't that be also a part that should be addressed about the mega cities of the future, how to integrate manufacturing and, and the industrial part? And if so, and that's the second question, uh, the issues of energy, water, air, which have a much more important, uh, higher important than just space, uh, as the discussion has right now. So I'm wondering how the participants think about that topic. Bob, would you like to take the manufacturing piece? Because I believe that's integrated into, of course, the whole economic city concept. Well, I, I think it's a great question, but the question is uh, a, a matter of competitiveness. Are you competitive in the industrial? Every city needs a reason to be, uh, to, a reason to exist. And I think if cities choose manufacturing, they need to plan accordingly. And, and you know, for us in Cake, we, we have uh, manufacturing plus logistics is about 50% of the city. But because we, can, we believe that we can be competitive in certain sectors, in, in uh, energy related, et cetera. So I think it's not a matter of general whether you, you, uh, you know, incorporate it or not. It depends on your competitive positioning vis-a-vis -vis other cities. Another question, please. Lady in red here. Meu nome é Zazia. Minha pergunta é para o senhor Otávio Sarvos. É um assunto de São Paulo. Esse, essa colocação sua, de, com a qual concordo, de que a gente deveria priorizar os ambientes já existentes e dar uma qualidade de vida melhor àqueles que trabalham para nós e para outros, é um pouco o que eu estou entendendo que a Casa Paulista está pretendendo fazer até certo ponto. Ah, eu sempre achei que seria maravilhoso poder morar no centro de São Paulo. E sempre ao falar com essas pessoas, ah, que, com quem eu perguntava, por que, que você não tenta o centro, sempre havia a questão da segurança. E onde eu vejo, uh, onde eu imagino que possa ser um lugar uh, seguro, sempre eu imagino crianças no parque, uma padaria, babás, pessoas circulando de dia, de tarde e, eventualmente, à noite. Que é muito difícil em São Paulo, onde a criminalidade está aumentando assustadoramente, todos os dias, como a gente pode ver pela televisão, pelo rádio. Então, como essa questão da segurança pode, no seu entender, como empreendedor, uh, ser, ser equacionada num momento como esse e num lugar como esse, o centro de São Paulo, onde a Casa Paulista quer priorizar os seus investimentos? Eu gostaria de ter a resposta, né? mas eu acho que, o, como a gente vive numa cidade que ela foi ficando cada vez mais desigual, eu acho que a, agora a gente se deu conta, uh, nós, classe média alta, que a gente caiu numa cilada que... A gente caiu numa cilada que nós armamos para nós mesmos. Né? Essa cilada é através de décadas que nós é, procuramos sempre afastar as pessoas de um nível social mais baixo para longe de nós. Né? A gente gosta delas quando elas estão trabalhando, mas a gente quer que elas morem longe. Isso foi exatamente o que aconteceu no centro. Né? O centro, quando ele, quando ele recebeu uma, uma imigração enorme nos anos 60, enfim, eu não vou saber, eu não, eu, eu não sou um catedrático, mas quando foi essa quantidade de gente para o centro, as pessoas mais risca, ricas foram embora de lá. Né? Então, eu acho que a primeira coisa que a gente deveria pensar e refletir é que o lugar mais seguro hoje da cidade é o lugar onde a classe média alta mora. Né? E eu acho que a maneira mais é, fácil de garantir a segurança para todos, né? porque eu acho que nós, da classe média alta, a gente está relativamente muito seguro aqui em São Paulo. Né? Eu acho que a maneira mais correta seria justamente o que eu já falei, seria trazer essas pessoas para cá. Como? Desapropriando parte desses bairros mais nobres, é, principalmente em, em situações onde eles estão subutilizados, aumentando a densidade nessas regiões que são valorizadas. O governo pode fazer isso. 
né? ele, ele pode fazer, ele tem todos os mecanismos para fazer, porque ele pode interferir no zoneamento, ele pode fazer PPPs, ele pode, é, enfim, criar mecanismos de outorga onerosa, como ele já criou, mas com o objetivo, primeiro, antes de pensar em, em coisas mais complexas, de fixar essa população, olha, fixar não, trazê-la de volta para esses bairros como esse, por exemplo, que a gente está, que é um bairro relativamente seguro. Quanto mais gente tiver nesses bairros, quanto mais gente tiver usando eles 24 horas por dia, mais seguros eles vão ser. Né? Mais fácil vai ser o policiamento também, porque as pessoas, você vai ter uma menor área de metros quadrados para tomar conta. Né? Então, eu acho que a gente tem que rever essa cilada que a gente acabou caindo, né? que é de espalhar tanto a cidade, né? por esse temor que, que a gente tem, que é histórico aqui no Brasil inteiro, de, de sempre ter uma casta, né? onde a gente procura se... Sempre a gente gosta de, de olhar a pobreza e tal, mas a gente não gosta que ela esteja no nosso vizinho. né? Eu, eu acho que a gente tem que repensar isso. A cidade deveria se compactar, a gente deveria trazer todo mundo de volta para cá e, e, e conviver um pouco com, com essa... É, a gente, se a gente acha que a nossa violência é grande, imagina a violência que tem no Capão Redondo ou em outros bairros da periferia. Eu acho que a gente deveria, antes de tudo, a gente deveria refletir sobre as decisões que a gente tomou em, to, em, em todas essas décadas aí que se passaram, né, de discussões do plano diretor a partir do momento que ele foi criado. É, o centro é, é um belo exemplo. Se o centro estiver habitado e ele estiver com vida 24 horas por dia, certamente ele vai ser mais seguro do que ele é hoje, né? não tem dúvida nenhuma. E ele é apenas um dos bairros, é, ele é uma das regiões da cidade que tem esse problema. Outras regiões têm problema semelhante também. E o centro, ele tem, o que, o que ele já tem, que outras, outras regiões de São Paulo não têm, é, ele tem já a infraestrutura que nós estamos conversando aqui, ele já tem isso. Às vezes você não precisa criar isso de novo, gastar todo esse dinheiro numa outra região, inventar um novo bairro para São Paulo, fazer um novo plano urbano, quando você já tem, você já tem tudo aquilo construído. Né? Para a maioria da população que é absolutamente pobre aqui, aquela construção é ótima. Né? É, a gente deveria usá-la melhor. Thank you. I think we have time for two more questions. Um, any others out there in the pen? Uh, we have one there in the microphone. Please go ahead. Hi, uh, my name is Anthony Ling. I'm an architect, uh, urbanist, living in Sao Paulo. Uh, I have a question for Fad Al Rashid about growth in a private city. So I noticed in your master plan that you have uh, zoned uses, and uh, it's similar as a real estate development, but in a massive size. But uh, it's a little bit different from what contemporary urbanism says on uh, adapting zones according to their uh, <coughs> demand, market demands a long time. And you've also said you changed the master plan three times in seven years, uh, which I don't know, maybe we'll probably have to change more in the next uh, years in the city. Uh, you also said it has capacity for two million people but maybe if it's very attractive, uh, it will need more capacity for that. So how do you deal with uh, this development cap, if you will say, and uh, continuing ad administration in a private development city? Um, uh, thanks for that question. I think, you look, if you look at the, the master plan that was developed 10 years ago, by the way, uh, 10 years ago, that master plan, or seven years ago, that master plan was considered best of the best. You know. Every little thing was articulated in it, by the way. But today, seven years later, only seven years later, it is completely outdated because the sustainability movement has moved so far away from what we used to do seven years ago. For example, let me give you an example. The master plan that you see now has no canals. The one before it had canals. We had more canals than Venice probably five times. Okay? <laughs> no, seriously. It was completely over-engineered, way too much concrete, we forced nature to do what we wanted to do rather than the other way uh, around. And frankly, I was in uh, New York during Sandy, the storm, and you know, you can't force do, uh, nature to do anything. So after that, we actually completely let nature take its course. Let water run where, where it wants to run, where it's been running for the past um, uh, 100 years, 
and step away from the water as much as possible and make it public. So, you know, just thinking about it, that's what I meant about changing the master plan. You're, you're, you know, you're not really changing them. You're revising it and updating it, etc. And it's really, although it shows a lot of use today, it's really very flexible. I mean, and, and it, it has to be a mixed-use environment. So you got labor housing near uh, industrial, etc. I think the whole point is to allow the least commute possible and the most mixed uh, mixed use in uh, in a development. I don't know if I answered your question, but you know, um, uh, I, as 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 good as uh, as okay. All right, time for one last question because I have an overwhelming urge to go outside. So we didn't me, get to the too, section. Didn't. Here's here's one question here, and then uh, and then we'll go out into the park before the park comes all the way into here. I, no, I have I, the microphone. Oh, sorry, whoever has a microphone, have a, you have, have, have the question. I have, I have the question. microphone here. Sorry. <laughs> me too. Go for it. OK. Um, I, my name is Maria Teresa, and I'm from the research center in the University of Sao Paulo, USP Cidades. And I'd like to disagree a little bit with Otavio with some things he had said. Uh, um, well, talking about Brazil, I think we're in a little bit different spot compared to other countries. We are ur more than 50% urban for a long time. We're 86% urban now. And many of the challenges we're facing in Sao Paulo and other cities in, in Brazil, um, they, they're challenges. We have these challenges because we have been urban for quite some time. And of course, the, the growth of the cities uh, we didn't have enough money or enough time to plan and uh, reach for this in, in time. So the, the cities grew very fast and it was not possible to plan ahead of time in that velocity. So that's why we have all these problems that we have. And in my opinion, the, with the limited resources that we have in Brazil and the, all, the, all the democratic issues with dictatorship that we had in the past, with the inflation in the 80s, I, I grew up we had 80% of inflation every month in Brazil. Mm. How do you plan for that? The money you have on the first day of the month, with the one real that you have, you need 18 reais on the 18th. Uh, it, it's not possible to plan and invest in that velocity and to design in that velocity in the country. So I think actually we have many uh, projects and many reference uh, creative ideas that have been developed in Brazil and in Sao Paulo that could actually be an example for other cities that are going to grow or starting to grow as fast as we have in the past. And I, I just want to leave a little bit more of a positive atmosphere of our past and, uh, and just to say that I don't think everything is bad in Sao Paulo and in Brazil. <laughs> Any of the panelists like to add to that as a closing note? Anyone? Anyone? No. Thank you all so much for coming. Thank you. A hand for our panelists, please. Um, conclusion to the panel. I, you know, I just think it was it was fascinating to discuss this because my takeaway was, and I think Octavio touched upon this was is in my work as a journalist and, and hearing all these perspectives is, is that we still lack, when it comes to the built environment, uh, the teams and the functions, the, the, the teams and the institutions that can bring all these perspectives together under one roof. I'm always amazed, for example, when dealing with architects. So many architects are reluctant to grapple with the technological or reluctant to grapple with the financial, absolutely, and, are, and resign themselves to being aestheticians, as Octavio said. And, you know, we have a distinct need, as I think this panel really proved, that we are building today at a scale that has never, ever been attempted, a true city-sized scale, where there are a handful of practitioners who are able to handle that. How do we build better multidisciplinary groups uh, that, can, that can best meet these challenges? Because none of the professions up here siloed can do it alone. So I don't know what the challenge is. I think it's a challenge for all of you. I don't know, Daniel, what is, what is your studio I, like these days? Can, may, can, can I just uh, comment on it? I think it's a great, uh, a very profound comment. You know, in the sciences, in the humanities, in the arts, questions are a fundamental aspect. You ask a question. It's not about answering, raising the questions. For too long in architecture, planning, urban design, answers were being given. Very few questions have been raised. And as you say, we live in a time of renaissance. This is a renewed sense that cities are coming, coming back to life after a, a long neglect, actually. So I think we live in a fantastic period 
where really this interdisciplinary notion that people can share knowledge, can come together, and that it's not about the dictator or, or somebody telling you what to do, but we have an intersubjective world which can actually create fantastic cities, and I'm confident that it will here in Sao Paulo as well. Great, thank you. Anyone else? Yes, Fab. Well, I can tell you that we, we're thinking a lot more about sustainability, and I talk about sustainability in the, in not only in the in environmental sense, but also in the social and economic. And I think as we think more about that and about life cycle costing of, 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 of every product you put out there, or every, every service, you know, you have to bring in everybody. You have to think about who is going to be using it, you know, who's going to be designing it. That design needs to be both using the right material, using the right, you know, uh, looking at the operational aspect of it. So I think it's, it's happening a lot more than you think today uh, it is happening. It's just not in a very organized fashion. I think the biggest challenge, to be frank, I see is about um, technology. Technology is out there. People are doing a lot of you know, technological advances in cities, and we, we, we discussed so many of them today, both on big data side and, and apps. And we'll see the apps uh, a competition tomorrow, which I'm very excited about. But how do you actually spread these technologies across cities when they're new? Big cities are not going to take technological risk. And that's, I think, the biggest challenge of pushing forward this next movement. Great. Well, thank you all again. Another hand for our panels, please. <laughs> That's beautiful. So we'll yeah. this way around. Right? Okay.